Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your hosts, Jim Person and Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Hello there, Knife Junkies, and welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Jim, the Knife Newbie Person. And I'm Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the show. Episode number 127 of the Knife Junkie Podcast, the midweek supplemental where you get a chance to, you know, kind of go with us deep into knives, hear about some of the knife news in the in the world going on today, get a chance to uh, learn about Bob's state of the collection and uh, maybe something that uh, he's got that you want to get or, uh, you know, get his insights into the, the knife world. But anyway, the Knife Junkie podcast is the place for knife newbies like me and knife junkies like you to learn all about knives and knife collecting. And a good show today. We've got a Start off with some more thanks, thankfully, <laughs> as well as uh, Knife Life News. We've got a another listener line call to share. And then, as we said at the intro, uh, Bob's got quite a bit to talk about in his state of the collection. And I'll just say Spartan Harsey, we're going to talk about that yes again, but there's a little bit of twist about that. So uh, we'll, we'll tease that for a moment, Bob. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, unfortunately, not much to say yet, but uh, we'll, we will say what we have to say. Okay. Well, we'll talk about it yet again, so we'll see what's going on with that. Hey, I mentioned that uh, we wanted to start it off uh, the show midweek like we did last week with uh, with thanks. And uh, thankfully for you, <laughs> we, you, you have the opportunity to say thanks, uh, but That's a couple right. more uh, patrons in the Patreon. Yeah, actually two very familiar names to the podcast and to, the, and to Thursday Night Knives, Jock's Knife. And Timothy Becker, two good friends of the show, have both pledged to become gentlemen uh, junkies. And a gentleman junkie is someone who who uh, spends ten dollars a month on our efforts on our show. It's to me, it's a uh, it's an honor uh, to think that someone would trade their hard earned money for us talking about knives. It's pretty mm-hmm. awesome. So yeah. uh, uh, thank you so much, Jock's Knife and Timothy. Uh, you will be getting stickers shortly. And uh, then you will be entered into the first knife drawing, uh, which will be the third Thursday of July. And that is, what is that? That's the 16th. July 16th. That's July right. 16th, yeah. And uh, I still have not decided what that knife is going to be, but I was thinking about it this morning and getting my uh, getting my ducks in a row. So mm. soon I will know what it is. Well, and uh, I'm sure it'll be a good one. And uh, as we uh, mentioned on the the last uh, supplemental, I think your your odds of winning are are pretty <laughs> darn good at this point yeah. because uh, the the knife junkie Patreon is just starting out. And again, the uh, the perk of joining at that ten dollar level is the chance to win a knife every month as long as you are entered into the or uh, you know a member of the gentleman junkie. You have a chance to win a knife every month at that ten dollar a month level. So Jock's knives and Timothy Becker join a few others at that gentleman junkie level and now are entered. That's right. And Kevin, uh, a friend of ours who uh, joined at the $5 level, the tactical junkie level, several weeks back, uh, just uh, re-upped or, or doubled his Up- pledge. Upgraded. Upgraded. That's what, that's what I mean. He upgraded his pledge, and he is also now uh, in that category. Thank you, Kevin. Much appreciated. You are now entered in to win a free, undisclosed, as of yet, knife. Well, and you said earlier, you know, uh, trading hard-earned money, money for, you know, hearing you talk. I like to look at it as they're trading their hard-earned money for a chance to win a knife. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, that's that's that could be closer to the truth. Or yeah. two things can be true at once. <laughs> well, that's true, and and hopefully, uh, you know, if you uh, listen to the podcast any at all, you know that Bob and I like to joke about the word bloviate, uh, which Bob <laughs> tends to do about knives, and uh, now he has a platform to do it, so his wife doesn't have to listen to him yeah. talk all the time about knives. So. Uh, she loves know. this podcast. Right. <laughs> so we, we thank you for listening. Obviously, uh, you don't have to become a member of the Knife Junkie Patreon uh, to, to do so. Uh, we have our podcast out on uh, most of the podcast players. It's also on YouTube. You can listen there. And uh, we certainly do appreciate the support, though. It, uh, it does help cover a lot of the cost as uh, we are hobbyist podcasters and uh, yeah. Yeah. all this coming out of the pocket. So. Thanks, everybody, for for being a member. And if you would like to join, it's theknifejunkie.com slash Patreon, theknifejunkie.com slash Patreon. You're listening to the Knife Junkie podcast. And now here's the Knife Junkie with the Knife Life News. Ivan Braganetz is coming out uh, with another collaborative design with Real Steel. 
Real Steel has been killing it with the collaborations, uh, well, ever since their inception, but it seems like it's snowballing and uh, they just have a lot of great names attached to their brand. Uh, Ivan Braganetz is no exception. He came out, I believe, at the beginning of this year or last year with the Rocket. And the Rocket we talked about on this show uh, is a real kind of futuristic yet uh, neutral and beautiful looking uh knife uh it's 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 in my wheelhouse of of length and such and uh he has a custom design uh called the akuma uh which he is now bringing to real steel and it is interesting because i look at it and it looks like a small knife to me it looks like a sub three inch pocket knife uh and yet when i read the specs it's actually quite big it's got a 3.74 you know three and three quarters inch blade so it's interesting, Jim, how it takes this look, this little uh, little knife look, and kind of blows it up into what looks to be a very comfortable and usable uh, sort of all-arounder, uh, if you consider a 3.74 an all-arounder. Looking at it on uh, Knife News, uh, as you say, the, the picture doesn't give it any perspective of how big it is, and I think, like you... The first impression I got when I saw the picture is, yeah, that's a that's a small little knife. Yeah, and I think part of what that is, Jim, is when you look at it, you see the big opening hole on the blade. Mm. Uh, uh, so in making this a real steel design, uh, uh, Ivan Braganetz uh, took this from a, a one-way opener, a thumb stud opener, to a three-way opener. Thumb stud, uh, there's an opening hole in the blade, and then also a kind of low-profile flipper. So he he kind of tripled tripled down on the opening mechanisms here. And mm. in doing so, he put this big, uh, it looks like a, a stylized uh, cut through nail neck in the center of the top of the blade. And, and that's what's throwing me off because that's where you would see a nail neck in a little pocket knife, right? Uh, you would see that sort of long shaped opening feature in the center of the blade. Whereas on a a four inch blade or a 3.75 inch blade, you would expect to see the opening hole closer to the Ricasso, closer to the handle. Um, so just a really neat, uh, interesting design. Gotta say, it doesn't, doesn't exactly, uh, get me that excited, but the handle is cool. And, uh, it, it's, it, I mean, there are features of it that are, are quite interesting. Like the, uh, it's got these bright orange liners. Mm -hmm. It's got sort of a knurled pattern sort of cut into it. Uh, into the handle, it's it's very well considered. I'll say that. Yeah, I like the little splash of color with the with the orange liners. I like it on the black. I'm not sure that's the picture I'm seeing. I'm not sure how I would like it with the uh, what is it green? I think that it also comes in. Yeah, but, I think it uh, comes yeah. in a green and a, so that would be like a that would have that sort of Swiss Army look, that sort of green and orange, which I have mm -hmm. to say does does appeal to me when it's oh, that okay. sort of army green. Uh, mm -hmm. But this is. Um, comes with K110 steel. That's one that you don't hear about too much. That's a bowler steel, and it's their sort of equivalent to D2, so a tough semi-stainless steel. Um, and it's going to come in at about 100 bucks. So you mm -hmm. get a lot of flair, a lot of design, um, and it seems like a lot of capability with this, with this very kind of neutral handle and uh, sort of classic-looking drop point blade. Mm -hmm. uh, fully flat ground, I think it'll be pretty good. Let me ask you a question. I know I often hear you and others talk about blade to handle ratio. Mm -hmm. But what does that mean when we're looking at this knife here? Because when I see the picture, again, as we've talked about before, mm -hmm. I, you don't have any perspective or depth about how big the overall knife is. But when I'm looking at this picture, it looks to me like it's got a bigger handle or, you know, a big handle mm -hmm. and a short blade. Is that yeah. what we're talking about, blade-to-handle ratio? That is. Uh, so, in this case, we have no other uh, object for scale in the photograph. Right. But you don't need that for to, to judge the – or to determine the blade-to-handle ratio. I think I think that's what you're, what you're uh, yeah. honing in on right now. Right. And, yeah, to me, this, this has sort of the, um, the same ratio loosely uh, speaking completely scientifically, it, it seems to have the same ratio as, say, like a paramilitary two, where for me, I want to see just a titch more blade. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, or maybe a bit less handle. I don't know. Right. Um, but for a knife that has a big blade like this, it, it it's almost erring on the side of caution or being prudent to add a little bit extra handle. Because with a large size blade, you might be tempted to do larger size work and then 
it, it might be best to have a handle. And when you look at this mm-hmm. handle, Jim, it's pretty angular. But uh, all of the angles at the pommel, there are three sort of angles that look like the top of a stop sign, basically, at the pommel. And to me, that is the perfect setup for in case you have to take this big work knife and 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 jam it into something in reverse grip. That's the perfect uh, place for your thumb to to purchase. Per- mm-hmm. Perfect design, I would say. Mm-hmm. So okay. in- interesting. Not as cool as the rocket in, in my mind, but interesting knife. Okay. Well, we're talking about uh, the new knife from uh, Real Steel. We'll have a link to that as well as the other uh, Knife Life news stories we'll cover coming up on the uh, show notes page. Again, the knifejunkie.com slash 127. The knifejunkie.com slash 127 is where you can find those show notes and uh, other stuff that we talk about here on the podcast. Uh, pictures and those kind of things, if I can remember to put them in there sometimes. But uh, we'll, we, we do the best we can. Uh, moving on in Knife Life News, uh, Benchmade back uh, in the uh, in the segment this week to talk about. Yeah, we're always talking about Benchmade, aren't we? Uh, well, that's because they're they're uh, they're always turning out knives. Nice. Yeah, man, they're 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 a big force, and uh, they have this really cool line of knives called the Hunt series, and I, they started doing this uh, a couple of years back, uh, maybe two or three years back, when they released the Crooked River and uh, and and the Grizzly Ridge and a couple of others. That was the first year they came out with this Hunt series. And uh, just as they've always had the black class for the tactical operator types, and they've had the gold class for the collector types, and then they had the red class for a short while for the cheap types. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, and, and, and then they came out, uh, kind of codified their hunting line with the, with the Hunt. Maybe it was actually even before uh, the Grizzly Ridge came out. In any case, they've really strengthened this line's uh, identity, and uh, this now this year they are they are coming out with upgrades of all of these models. They had the Sa- Saddle Mountain Skinner and uh, Steep Country, the Hidden Canyon Hunter, and the Hidden Canyon. And now these are all various length hunting knives. Uh, for instance, the Saddle Mountain Skinner has has one of those big. Uh, uh, what do you call it? The grooves in the back. Oh, geez. You can tell I'm a real hunter, but it, uh, one of those <laughs> skinning notches <laughs> in the back. Uh, they've, they've tweaked the jimping on that. They've, uh, they've changed the sheath a little bit. Uh, oh, gut hook. That's the, that's the term I'm looking for. I, I was going to tell you, but no. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Jim. You just bought that sweet buck with the gut hook, but we'll talk about that later. Yeah. Now, in this new line of hunts, you know, this, this reboot here, they're, um, if you see a dash one after the number, like the fifteen o two dash one saddle mountain skinner, that means it's the fifteen o o two, fifteen o o two. Yes, right. Fifteen o o two dash one. That means it's all upgraded. So instead of S thirty five blade steel and diamond wood handle scales, you're going to get rich light, which is kind of like uh, uh, micarta. Uh, Emerson's been using it a lot. An S90V, the one steel no one in the world likes to sharpen, but it is a super, super, super steel. So they they did this with the Saddle Mountain Skinner. They did it with the uh, Hidden Canyon. You can get a, a Dash 1 version of it. And uh, and then a couple of the knives, like the Steep Country, they just sort of tweaked the blade uh, size or the shape and, and uh, added different sheath options. So uh, it's kind of exciting to me, uh, only because I'm looking at the one... The big fixed blade hunter and uh, what is this called? The hidden can uh, the hidden canyon. You look. You're looking at the picture on uh, Knife News. Yes. This is that the Saddle Mountain. I think that's the uh, Saddle Mountain Skinner, the upgraded version. Whatever I'm looking at, Jim, <laughs> I, I love. It looks. It looks really great, and and it t- it tickles a couple of my my tastes. First of all, you can see they move jimping. There are two uh, runs of jimping up the blade, and I love that when you have a a mid. It's just sort of a mid-length uh, run of jimping for your forefinger or or for whatever mm. if you got big thumbs or whatever. But I, I love the way this knife in particular looks. It could it could be something that you have on your belt uh, while you're in the outdoors, whether it's uh, camping or for me in the backyard, you know, putzing around, Cut, cutting vines, cutting vines, exactly. Or you could kind of see this uh, in a more tactical role. It just kind of looks like it uh, it could cover a lot of bases. Yeah, I love the handle design. And uh, one thing you, I thought you were going to talk about in the in the Dash One, those uh, premium version or upgrade mm-hmm. versions. Um, 
Benchmade's uh, grind, uh, select edge oh, grind. Yeah, that's right. Thanks, Jim. The the fourteen uh, degrees on both sides edge grind for for uh, enhanced uh, cutting. Fourteen degree side bevels for each side, so that uh, it's a less obtuse angle, and you get and you get uh, slicier, better action. And I could see how. Being someone who has never skinned an animal, I'm just going to say that as a caveat. Raise my hand too. I I could see how a a, a really, really, really sharp and um, I don't want to say thin behind on the edge because that's not what it's saying, but a really, really uh, steep angle like that or or narrow angle like that could could really you you just kind of touch it to the skin and it parts. You don't want to go too far. You don't want to have to add too much pressure because you don't want to rupture anything underneath the skin, right? I'm assuming. Mm -hmm. And, and so you want to be able to control it. And with a super sharp, super fine edge, it seems like it might be easier to control. Now, everyone who has heard me, who has ever done that before is like, is, is scratching their head right now or just kind of shaking their head. So tell me if I'm right or wrong. This 14 degrees on both sides, that means a really, really thin edge bevel. Is this going to, is this going to make it better for skinning? It just seems like it would be. And obviously Benchmade, they know their stuff and they thought it would be. So. Mm-hmm. <sighs> school me. Well, school Bob, uh, on the listener line, you can call and uh, leave him your comments, uh, thoughts, uh, set him straight. Tell us what the uh, edge is all about. 724-466-4487. That's 724-466-4487. That's the listener line. We would love for you to call so that uh, way we can uh, hear you and also uh, play your comment or question or thoughts back on an upcoming podcast like we have a listener line calling up, a uh, listener line call coming up. Uh, but uh, if you would like to just send Bob an email, uh, and maybe we can read some of your comments, that would be fine. Email bob at thenifejunkie.com. And it would be cool to have people tell me what they prefer in a hunting knife. It's, this is not something I talk about often because I have no real expertise in it, uh, but I would be interested to find out what it is. Do you like these expensive, uh, do you like a more expensive refined hunting knife? Or do you like the idea of those little folders with the replaceable scalpel blades? Do you like, uh, you know, do you like the idea of, of an expensive knife getting in the grit like that? Or do you like something that seems more disposable for that job? I'd be very interested to, to, to hear what you, uh, what anyone who hunts and does that thinks. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, all of these uh, Benchmade knives will be available later this month. They say around July 27th, except for the uh, steep country, which will be available in the month of September. So our final story in Knife Life News comes from Essie. I I finally, I think, learned how to pronounce that one, Bob. E-S-E-E. Essie, is that right? Yeah, that's right. It's Essie. And they are uh, one of the preeminent outdoor knives uh, out there these days. I have an Essie Hunglis next to me. It's a giant 10-inch outdoor knife. Uh, my brother incidentally buried one in his leg. That's a whole nother story. <laughs> I think you may have mentioned it on the podcast. Yeah. Right. Uh, but so they have, have made a real meaningful upgrade to the CR 2.5, which is this really cool little handy uh, drop point fixed blade with a micarta handle. Sort of remind, uh, reminds me of an SE Zancudo, uh, which is a little folder. It's sort of like the fixed blade version of that. Well, they've made a, they've come out with a CR, I, I should say, Jim, they are coming out. With a CR 3.0, meaning they haven't quite brought it out yet. And you look at it and you can tell right away it's, it's in the same line, but it's a totally different knife. They've added a half inch to the blade, but it's the same super useful drop point, uh, fully flat ground shape. And then they've taken the handle. They've elongated it. Uh, I'm not sure by what, but it looks like about half an inch and they've sort of, uh, bracketed it so that it's, it's got a, the choil up front so that your hand doesn't slide up onto the blade, but it also has more of a bird's beak in the back so that when you grip this thing in your hand, uh, it's bracketed on both sides. Uh, they have these beautiful contoured handles and, uh, it looks like an interesting material, but I'm not exactly sure what it is. When we find out what that is for sure, I will, I will tell you all, mm-hmm. but I have my suspicions. And and that's and that suspicion is Bakelite. I think it's Bakelite. You know the the what they used to make uh, furniture on AK forty sevens out of. It's sort of this plastic. It's kind of what it looks like. And then they have them posed on two AK forty seven magazines here. So I think I might be right, but we'll see. <laughs> right. 
So they've also done something that's unusual for SE. They SEs are almost straight across the board, 1095 high carbon steel because they are outdoor knives, they are camp knives, they are uh, survival knives, and 1095 is just an incredibly tough and forgiving steel, takes a great edge, sharpens easily in the field. For the smaller knives, like this uh, CR 3.0, SE is starting to use S35VN, which makes perfect sense. These are small, uh, kind of burden trout style blades. You're not going to be, they're not going to be receiving high impact. So they don't need that sort of tough, high carbon 1095 steel. S35VN is perfect because it sharpens easily. Again, it keeps a great edge. It's very corrosion resistant. And for a stainless steel, it is pretty tough. I think that's why they evolved that steel out of S30. I think S30VN was just chippy enough that they decided to uh, make something a little tougher. Mm-hmm. So S35VN seems like the perfect uh, perfect thing. And now now you get that, uh, two choices of, she- of sheath here. Now, for me, with this knife, looking at it, I would, I would love a high-grain, beautiful uh, sort of leather pouch sheath. But they give you two options, Kydex or Poly. And I say, what's the difference? I don't know what the difference is. Uh, Kydex or Poly. I think, I think Kydex is a little softer and easier to mold and Poly isn't. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know. I'm just going to, I'm just going to pretend like, no, I'm not going to pretend like I know. Someone tell me what's the difference between Kydex and Poly. Yeah. Email or call Bob and let him know. Let, Let me know. Yeah. I don't know either. Yeah. I mean, when you look at this knife, it, it deserves a beautiful, Leather yeah, pouch. it does. I think it would go well in leather, especially as I'm looking at the uh, the story on Knife News. That we'll have a link to in the show notes page. I like the top one. And to me, that, yeah. uh, well, the top two, actually. Mm-hmm. And uh, again, leather uh, sheath would just seems like it would work wonderf- wonderfully in that. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, they don't have an official uh, come out date, but uh, sometime in the fall, September, October is when yep. they're looking at. Yep. So, uh, you know, definitely it uh, would be interesting to uh, get somebody from SE Knives on to uh, maybe sometime in the summer to uh, talk about the upcoming uh, uh, release dates or that kind of thing or talk about some of these knives. So, uh, SE folks, if you're listening, uh, shoot Bob an email or give us a call on the listener line, 724-466-4487. Love to uh, talk with you about uh, these new knives and anything else going on there. Great idea, Jim. Thank you. I'm, I'm <laughs> <laughs> well, I love it. I'm always constantly thinking. Yeah, there's so many interesting people to talk to, and, and it's behind every knife. There's an interesting person. I, I hadn't thought of the SE folks yet. So Absolutely. Yeah, I'd love to have you. And now that we're caught up with Knife Life News, let's hear more of the Knife Junkie podcast. Back on episode number 127 of the Knife Junkie podcast, we've mentioned it a couple of times already this episode, the listener line where we would love to get your feedback, 724-466-4487. And that's what we've got now, Bob. Uh, we've got a uh, phone call uh, on the listener line that we want to play, uh, actually from our good buddy Stu Ashley, uh, who uh, gave us a call and uh, had some had some interesting thoughts. And uh, we'll hear that now. Yes, Bob and Jim, it's Stuart Ashley. I just calling to let you know that um, the episode one sixteen that you did with Dave Wattenberg of Protec was really awesome and inspired me to go as soon as i was done with the podcast go on to uh, blade hq and order a godson from blade hq just because of how dave explained the sort of ripple effects of what happens when you purchase a usa made knife so anyway keep up the good work hope you guys are having a good summer see ya Stu is not the first person to have mentioned uh how much uh, Dave Wattenberg's assessment of, of what it is to buy a knife, uh, in America from an American distributor, from an American company, what that actually means, the mm-hmm. ripple effect that that has, uh, as Stu just said. Um, that is probably the, uh, the, the greatest takeaway from, uh, one of the greatest takeaways from all of our podcasts is that it is, it is true that every knife you buy from an American distributor, made by an American company, has an incredible, incredible ripple effect. Just think of the person who's making the coffee and selling the coffee for the guy who delivers the knives. You know, it's an endless, uh, yeah. endless effect. Yeah, well, it's, you know, when you stop and look at it or think about it, uh, you know, the economy, we're all intertwined, you know, and uh, that's what's, I guess, been the hardest thing about this uh, worldwide pandemic with a lot of people not working, 
not having to go to the office. Gas prices have definitely plummeted, which, you know, is good and bad. It's good if you're having to purchase gas. Uh, but, you know, think about the, the less traffic. So there's all the good things that come with that. Then there's the bad things of people that are maintaining cars or doing maintenance or buying, you know, selling tires or things like that. So it's it's all intertwined, you know. Yeah, and, and that's and one. one little, that's just one industry. Yeah, one industry. Oh, yeah. So gosh. yeah, just the the ripple and the the intertwinement. So great, uh, great um, thoughts about that podcast. We'll have a link to that in the show notes in case uh, you missed it. You can go back and listen to that episode with uh, with Dave Wattenberg. Ever strop a knife again? Even though it gets no real use, face up to what you are. You're a knife junkie. Well, in the spirit of Stu's call and in the spirit of having a positive ripple effect throughout the economy that I'm entrenched in, I did something. You're going to buy knives and help everybody else? I, I did. I, <laughs> I took action on the 4th of July. Ooh, all right. And ordered a Spartan Harzy folder. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> I've been talking about it, talking about it, talking about it. And then the other night on Thursday Night Knives, Alex just kind of gave me this, dis this, this disgusted look and said, just Pull the trigger, Bob. Right. You keep talking and talking and talking. And what are you I waiting like, on? I was like, man, I am going to make these words reality. So uh, I have done my part for the economy, and I'm going to do my part for the knife economy soon and sell a couple um, and uh, and and send a, send a couple of these knives and g give a couple of good deals of some great knives I have that I'm not. I know you've heard me say it a million times. I have to sell a couple. Uh, but yeah, I, I am really looking forward to the Spartan Harzy. We spoke with William Harzy uh, a couple of podcasts back. Just such a great guy and a classic in the knife world. And every one of his designs, I feel I can identify, um, especially the uh, the non daggery ones. Though I'm getting to know his dagger, his dagger style too. But just beautiful knives all around, and I'm I'm very excited to have this. And when I get it, I'm going to call him and I'm going to say, Bill, I got one of your knives, Bill. <laughs> He's going to say, that's great, kid. Yeah, thanks. Who are you? <laughs> he, he is such a cool guy. <laughs> yeah, 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 he was. Yeah, like like Bob said, we'll try to have a link to that uh, podcast with Bill Harsey in the uh, show notes if you miss that. Uh, uh, KnifeJunkie.com slash 127, the KnifeJunkie.com slash 127. And uh, you were so excited. You, you couldn't wait to get that out. I thought we were going to cover some of the, the yeah. other things in the state of the collection, but Bob was like, Spartan Harsey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was the last on my list. But, you know, I thought it was a, a kind of a, a poetic segue from Stu's, you know, oh, and I, and I wanted nice. this was a good way to justify it, make it feel good in my own gut. So thank okay. you, everyone. I hear you. No, that, that sounded good. That sounded good. And we will definitely look forward to uh, hearing more about that on future podcasts, as well as seeing it in video, uh, as well as uh, I'm sure you'll show it off on Thursday Night Knives. Uh, coming up here one time. But uh, speaking of uh, the state of the collection, uh, we'll backtrack a little bit and talk mm -hmm. about some other knives. Oh, yeah, good yeah, gosh. Right. I mean, you know, not the Spartan Harsey, but hey, uh, you know, some other good stuff that uh, you wanted to talk about in relation to July 4th, I think, as we're just coming off oh, the July oh, 4th yes. holiday. You're speaking of the great Ikea Build-A-Thon massacre of July 4th, 2020. Yes, yes, it was a it was a dire occasion. Uh, my wife did a whole bunch of ordering on Ikea for um, patio furniture, all stuff that uh, that, you know, she said, do you like this? I was like, yeah, that's spectacular. And it all showed up on the 4th of July and we oh, built it. And it was, you know what? I'm one of those guys who actually likes putting those together. I like put putting Ikea furniture together. You know, I love it when that last little bolt goes in and there are no extra pieces. And I know I've done it correctly and I'm not that doofus guy that they have in the instructions. Anyway, uh, with this giant order of stuff, there was a massive amount of cardboard. And oh my gosh, I got so excited. <laughs> I got so excited. And I had three little knives that I've been dying to try out on cardboard. And, and you know, without, without just going out to the recycling. And I just wanted to have some extended use with these knives. And those knives are? And those knives are the Cold Steel Kiridashi, the little new folder. Mm -hmm. uh, for 2020, uh, the uh, CRKT Pete, I'm sorry, the CRKT Pete, I heard my P pop, uh, designed by Vox, mm -hmm. beautiful, beautiful little knife. And then the Finch Runtley, the knife that is an adverb that I got, uh, that I won in the pass around group, Lotto, mm -hmm. when it was done. 
Okay, so two of them are Warren Cliff, you know, the Kiridashi and the Finch Runtley are Warren Cliffs. So they have completely straight edges and then not too pointy at the front. And then the Pete is all belly. It's it's a full bellied drop point, pre- pretty much fully flat ground knife. So these three knives performed in a surprising fashion. Now they all have they have they have different steels. The Finch is N690. Uh the Cold Steel has some uh, weird 4034 SS stainless steel I've never heard of before. And then the uh the Vox or uh, the CRKT is 8 CR13 MOV. So we we all have a, a an idea of N690 is probably the best. The Cold Steel is probably in the middle and then the CR uh 8 CR13 is probably the least in terms of edge holding. Uh, I made sure they're all razor sharp, brought them out, uh, and just started cutting and cutting and cutting and cutting. And my God, did I cut? And, uh, I found that my favorite of all of these to use was the cold steel Kiridashi. And I think it's a combination of a couple of things. And I'll tell you what those are in a moment. But the close second was the Finch Runtley. And, uh, I'm looking like, what, what are the, what are the uh, things that are similar about them? And that is that they have that utility blade shape, that mm-hmm. worn cliff shape with the straight edge. And man, it just, you never have to cut twice with this, uh, because the material doesn't shy away from the blade as your arm arcs and your arm and your hand and your wrist and your elbow. It all takes on natural arcs. And, uh, and as you cut with a knife that has a, a full belly, it shies away from the material as your as your body arcs away from from the cut, and uh, you know that's something that is obvious and that kind of everyone knows. But it really, really showed itself in the monotonous uh, cutting of uh, of material uh, of cardboard over and over and over. Another thing I discovered is that I really don't like choils, uh, like like the peat. For instance, the, the the Vox designed CRKT Pete has a has a sort of half choil. I guess it's more of a sharpening choil than a finger choil, but it's a very large sharpening choil. And I kept getting bound up in that. I would mm. I would be doing long cuts and not you know not spending a lot of time to set up each cut. You know, when you're cutting a whole bunch of cardboard, you just kind of slicing and dicing, slicing and dicing, and 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 it kept getting caught up in this big choil here. So I would have to cheat my finger up and kind of put Mm. my finger in that choil, but it's not built for a finger. So I found that to be a bit of a pain in the ass, but a really, really uh, great little knife for um, other stuff. I just wouldn't use it for a lot of cardboard. Another interesting thing about the peat is that it's a, it's a, it's an eighth of an inch thick. It's a thick blade, Mm. you know, Mm. it, it, it comes down to a pretty nice edge um, and it's, practically fully flat ground but it's a little fatty for such a small blade um the kiridashi and the finch runtley are both uh the same blade stock and unfortunately i didn't measure them so i'm not exactly sure what that is uh and they both have about the same angle of approach in terms of their uh secondary bevels Uh, it's just that the finch has a lot more material above it but since it acts like a wedge um when when cutting it kind of parts the uh, material and pushes it away from that flat anyway. So uh, these two knives just worked out great for, for lots of cardboard. And I, I would say, uh, you know, if you're a, if you're a high end cardboard cutter, the Finch <laughs> Runtley, <laughs> if you have 30 bucks to spend, this cold steel Kiridashi is just awesome. I love it. Okay. So tied for first or cold steel first and, and the Finch Runtley second. Is that what I heard? Yeah. Yeah. That's how I would do it. Okay. And then the the Pete third, but all great knives. I love them all. And then Jim, actually, I didn't have this on my list, but what I was carrying in my pocket was an unexpected hit with the cardboard. I couldn't believe how great this thing was with the cardboard. I was carrying my ZT zero nine twenty, which is a uh, a large recurved uh, um, Les George uh, design based on his custom harpy, and that thing flew through cardboard. I always kind of figured it was a little bit thick and uh but with that recurve and the edge I put on it, it just man, what a great knife that ended up being. Totally unexpected for that purpose that is. Right, right. All right, well we'll try to uh grab a picture of the uh Cold Steel Kiridashi CRKT Pete and the Finch Runtley maybe all uh, all together and uh 
uh, put that in the show notes as well. All together and unclean. I'll leave all the gook on them so that oh, you can tell I did hard work with these. The cardboard just whined as Bob sliced it. <laughs> still to hear particles. the lamentation of the cardboard. <laughs> yeah. See all that cardboard just hanging off the blade. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Rad. All right. Well, what did you do for your July 4th holiday? Did you have a cardboard massacre at your house as well? <laughs> Give us a call on the listener line, 724-466-4487, and uh, let us know uh, what you did over the holiday weekend and what kind of uh, knife activities uh, that you were involved in. We have mentioned uh, Thursday Night Knives uh, before. That, of course, coming up uh, tomorrow, if you're listening uh, to this podcast when it comes out on Wednesday. Tomorrow night, 10 p.m. Eastern, Thursday Night Knives. You can find that at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube, theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. You can also find uh, all the past episodes, the replays, if you will, at theknifejunkie.com slash Thursday. Uh, that's where we'll have all of those shows archived in case you missed anything. And we've been having this lovely trend of people super chatting during Thursday Night Knives, and that is basically commenting and donating uh, a little bit of money to the to the podcast and to the show. And I got to say right now, thank you so much to everyone who does that. I really, really appreciate it. I would name names now, but I don't want to leave anyone out. And I, right. I don't, uh, but I'm very, very grateful. So come yeah. join us. It's such a fun show. People just drop in uh, and, and we talk knives. We had what we had four guests this last time. It just kept snowballing. It was mm-hmm. a lot of fun. Yeah. Guest co-host uh, Therapeutic Edge and women carry knives. And uh, then that's, uh, some point uh, they were talking about uh, Dirk Warning, yeah. Uh, Dirk and Warning so, so he popped in, and then uh, something came up. I think we mentioned Alex or something. I know there's some comments about Alex, so he yeah. popped in. Alex's knife box. So uh, yeah, four, uh, four. Well, actually, five guests with uh, or three guests, and then you that made five. Yeah. So uh, yeah, uh, it's always great when folks can uh, can pop in and do that, and it's really easy. Um, you know, even if you. Just have a smartphone. It's got a camera. It's got one of the best cameras you can have. So uh, just right. get on your smartphone and pop in for a couple of minutes. You don't have to stay for the entire show. Uh, maybe there's something Bob's talking about or a knife that's uh, being talked about, and you've got one. You want to show it off and, uh, you know, just just come on the show, man. That, that That's what makes it so fun. I, I agree. And we have a knife fight at the end of each show, and that's that's a debate. And I come up with some very, very important question, like what's better, a button lock or an access lock? And then and then either I debate with a co-host or the guests debate with one another. And uh, and uh, this past week we had a uh, husband and wife, uh, as as Jim just mentioned, a therapeutic edge and women carry knives. They have their own separate uh, knife channels. Uh, but as you would imagine, as husband and wife, they intersect. And uh, having them on the show, um, we had them debate actually that question, button lock versus access lock. And it was great to put them on the spot and to sort of, Force them into some sort of marital conflict, right, for our <laughs> entertainment. Now you're instigating like Alex did on that show. <laughs> yeah, and that's why i am uh, got a Spartan Harzy in, in coming. <laughs> uh, before we wrap, Jim, I just wanted to talk about another friend of the show, uh, Jared Neve uh, from Neve's Knives. Now, Jared and Kara have a popular knife channel where they both uh, come on and analyze knives. And um, Jared has been really, really digging into freehand sharpening. And I know he learned a lot from a uh, guest of our show, Mike Emler, uh, who's, uh, who's got crazy sharp uh, sharpening uh, out on the West Coast. And uh, so I sent Jared my Emerson sax, as I've mentioned before, which, of course, uh, it being a Warncliffe, I had dropped on the tip at some point. And uh, I asked him to take care of that and to sharpen it up. You know, I was pretty happy with the edge, but, you know, sharpen it up, but please fix that tip. In very short order, he not only fixed the tip, which is... A very difficult thing to do, especially freehand uh, on freehand, you know, freehand on stones. But he gave this thing such an incredible, incredible screaming edge. It is so sharp. I can't believe it. It's like it's in the same league as my uh, as my razor edge reground uh, XM18. And uh, so I'm really, really, really happy with this. And Jared just did a fantastic job. And a, another great little bonus is that uh, he took the little recurve, the little smile at the base of the blade away. Now, sometimes in factories when people are sharpening, uh, putting the edge on the knife, uh, they get towards the handle and they have to be careful. They don't want to ding, you know, a part of the handle or the or the thumb stud or whatever. And maybe they get a little sheep, sheepish with the edge towards the sharpening choil. 
And uh, and then you get this little curve down, a little smile. Sometimes people call it. It's kind of more like a frown, if you ask me. But it's it's kind of an imperfection on the edge. And he took it and ground it away. And it this thing looks perfect. So mm-hmm. Jared, thank you. You did an awesome job. And I, I got I'm going to be sending more knives to him. Uh, I'm not sure if he's accepting work on the open market, but I, I can't see why he wouldn't. He busted it out so quick and did su- such an amazing job. All right. Well, you know, we've had, uh, what, a couple of knife sharpeners on the podcast before. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, I know in the background or, you know, offline, I've been, you know, teasing you about uh, that would be a great thing to, to get into for, for a sideline or a little, little extra money. But, uh, you know, there is definitely, uh, it's not like you can just pick up some stones or a sharpening machine and, uh, you know, become good at it. There is some skill mm-hmm. and practice required. Yeah. So, uh, you know, definitely uh, congratulations to Jared for everything that he has learned and uh, involved in. And I'm glad that you were happy with that uh, that knife. And uh, again, hopefully, maybe if you'll remember, take a picture and we'll uh, we'll put it in the uh, the show notes that folks can find at the knifechunky.com slash 127. So that was a reminder to me that the whole world heard. So you I better make take this picture. <laughs> That's right. Write yourself a note like you do with your pen on, on your on hand pen. <laughs> so you don't forget it. So tonight when you go get ready for bed and you brush your teeth and look at hand and you go, what does this say? Oh. Yeah. yeah I'll, I'll look at my hand and say, I can't believe I didn't wash my hand all day. <laughs> <laughs> all right, folks. We'll, we'll, we'll end it at that. Give that a lovely thought for you for our knife junkie. <laughs> We do want to thank you for joining us on the Midweek Supplemental, episode number 127 of the Knife Junkie podcast. And uh, coming up this Sunday on our interview show, uh, show Bob, uh, you want to tease who our guest is going to be? We have LaVon from the Knife Nuts podcast. The Knife Nuts podcast is the, I think it was the first, uh, but it's the biggest knife podcast out there. And uh, it's made up of four great guys, all knife nuts. And uh LaVon is kind of the ringmaster, I feel like. He's got everything I want before I know it exists, and he's got an incredible Instagram feed, and we had a great conversation. So we look forward to that this coming Sunday. That'll be on the Knife Junkies website at thenifejunkie.com, as well as on your favorite podcast app. And at some point later on Sunday, you'll find it on the Knife Junkies Facebook page, as well as the Knife Junkies YouTube channel. So a lot of different places where you can catch the podcast, as well as... uh, Bob's Knife Videos and Thursday Night Knives and all that kind of good stuff. All right, Bob, I think we have, to use your favorite word, bloviated long enough this week on the Midweek Supplemental. So let's uh, let's wrap it up. Thank everybody for joining us on number 127 of the Knife Junkie podcast for Mr. Knife Junkie himself, Bob DeMarco. I'm the Knife Newbie over here, Jim Person, saying thanks so much for joining us on the Knife Junkie podcast. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Podcast.